All right, welcome and thank you for joining us today. We're going to be discussing the rapidly evolving data center landscape, specifically design and technology trends and solutions for maximizing efficiency. My name is Evangeline Klingbeil. I'm Business Development Manager for Data Centers at Danfoss, and I'm joined by my friends and colleagues today who will go ahead and introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Michael Struboulis. I'm Business Development Director for Data Centers here in Danfoss. Hello, everyone. My name is Rami Dalba, Global Data Centers Business Development Manager at Danfoss. Hi, and I'm Ken Kaler, Senior Key Account Manager for Danfoss and Sales Driver for Danfoss TurboCore Compressors. All right, so first let's get into some background information on why it's so important that we find effective, efficient solutions for data centers. Michael, could you speak to this a little bit? Yes, Evangeline, thank you for allowing me to kick off today's coffee talk. So data centers are one of the most energy intensive building types that are under increasing pressure to decarbonize. According to the U.S. Department of Energy, data centers account for about 2% of U.S. electricity usage and emit as much CO2, carbon dioxide, as the entire airline industry. So cooling systems account for about 30 to 40% of that electricity and the impact they have on controlling energy consumption in data centers is striking. Because of the scale, the 24-7 operation and other equipment factors, minor improvements in energy efficiency have an overproportional effect on decarbonization and climate change. So, Michael, how exactly do data centers save energy during peak demand periods? And could you speak a little bit to the strategies that they employ? Yes, of course. Uh, Thank you for the excellent question. Supplementing energy needs by adding or expanding energy storage systems to renewable sources like wind and solar power already being used in data centers helps offset carbon emissions. There are floating data centers that use surrounding water to cool them. There are submersible data centers. There are data centers that are installed in abandoned salt mines. There are data centers that are being built in cold climate zones. And of course, there are data centers that use free or less cooling, while at the same time, they're allowing the servers to run hotter. Um, There are also fuel cells that are popping up in a few locations and small modular reactors are on the horizon as well. These types of solutions are thought of as primary sources of power for the data centers with the grid becoming the backup. Of course, there's free cooling when ambient and workload conditions are favorable during peak demand. So this is what data center operators are doing today. Thank you, Michael. Um, So, Ken, with uptime and reliability being the number one primary concern um, to data center operators, is there a trade-off that you see between energy efficiency and performance of the cooling system? A little bit, I think. So in designing and retrofitting a data center, it's a specialized engineering discipline because of the specific requirements of data center owners and operators they expect to meet. The main requirements based upon security, both physical and cyber security, uptime and sustainability. So when it comes to energy efficiency, the cooling systems not only need to be the most efficient, but they also need to be the most reliable. Through cooling system costs is a major consideration in new builds and retrofits, reliability surpasses cost and all drives and drives all decisions. There's no room for disruption caused by any equipment in a data center, especially cooling. The best opportunity of energy efficiency is cooling and heat removal from data centers, raising the cooling temperature such that less work is required to reject or reuse the rejected heat. The primary challenge is solutions that also allow heat recovery and reuse, including immersion and direct-to-chip cooling, are disruptive to an industry already obsessed with uptime. So let's talk a little bit about retrofits now. Rami, uh, do existing data centers face challenges with regards to retrofitting them with the newer cooling solutions for eff- energy efficiency? Yes, uh, of course, there are many challenges of retrofitting an existing data center for energy efficiency. Challenges from cost, complexity, and the willingness to change. Um, CapEx or upfront cost um, is, is um, something that they consider 
as an energy efficient data center, designs can be more expensive to implement than traditional designs. This is because they often require the use of more advanced technologies, such as advanced servers that require a highly efficient cooling system. And designing or retrofitting a data center for energy efficiency can be a complex and a challenging task. This is because there are many factors to consider, such as the size and the layout of the data center, the electrical infrastructure, the type of IT equipment being used, and the climate in which the data center is located. And also the reluctant to change. Uh, data center operators are risk averse and may be reluctant to change their existing infrastructure, even if that infrastructure is inefficient. Although they are concerned that changing their system may have unintended consequences on their uptime or business uh, continuity, uh, the opposite is actually true. Newer systems are designed to be simpler and more reliable, which can actually improve uptime and business continuity. They are also more efficient, which can save the company money. And Evangeline, maybe you can comment if, uh, is it difficult to balance the need to reduce carbon emissions and energy consumption with the need to maintain reliability and performance of the HVAC systems in the data center? Great question, Rami. <clears throat> and no, it's not difficult at all to improve data centers' energy efficiency and thereby also reduce uh, carbon emissions while at the same time maintaining reliable data centers. For example, by using variable speed drives to optimize the energy consumption of cooling and other equipment. Also using energy efficient cooling solutions such as free cooling. Also using renewable energy sources such as solar and wind power to offset the energy consumption of the data center and by recovering and reusing the heat generated by the data centers. So by implementing these measures, it's possible to reduce the energy consumption without compromising reliability or performance. And this can lead to significant cost savings as well as environmental benefits. So now I'd like to pivot and talk about some of the emerging cooling technologies. And uh, Michael, I'd like to have you speak a little bit to what are some of the latest trends and technologies uh, in the HVAC equipment when designing sustainable data centers? And are there any emerging technologies that can help us improve efficiency? Yes, Evangeline, the choice of HVAC equipment for a sustainable data center will depend on many factors, including climate, the data center size, the type of equipment, and of course the budget. However, by choosing the right equipment and implementing the latest technologies, data center operators can reduce their energy consumption and environmental impact while also ensuring the reliability and performance of their data centers. Precision air conditioning is the primary way to cool data centers, and it has been around for a long time, particularly for low rack power density data centers for some time. Um, however, as high performance computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, the Internet of Things, large language uh, models and other evolving computing technologies proliferate, rack power densities are rising, and liquid cooling is becoming essential to ensuring reliability and performance. Computer room air conditioning and computer room air handling units and row-based containment cooling solutions are ideal to about 15 to 20 uh, kilowatts of IT power. But there is a point around 20 kilowatts beyond which these types of, of equipment are no longer cost effective or efficient. And at that point, you start to look at other techniques that go closer to the source of the heat. And in this way, we have developed rack rear door cooling or cooling that is even closer than that, such as techniques to cool microchips directly using direct-to-chip or liquid immersion cooling. 
So when speaking about uh, liquid cooling, um, that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. So Rami, um, can you tell us how you define liquid cooling and um, differentiate chilled water loops from liquid cooling? What are the pros? What are the cons? And how can data centers implement liquid cooling? Well, definitely, that's a great question. Thank you for asking, Evangeline. Um, as you mentioned, some people might mix between chilled water loop cooling and the liquid cooling, which are two different methods of cooling computer servers or IT equipment. The chilled water loop cooling uses a centralized chilled water system to cool the entire data center. The chilled water is pumped through pipes that run through heat exchangers in each cooling equipment inside the data holes. It could be a cray unit, for example and then it will transfer the heat from the servers to the chilled borer. So the chilled borer then returns to the central chilled water system where it's cooled and recirculated again. Conversely, liquid cooling circulates a liquid coolant directly over the chips or servers. The coolant absorbs the heat from the chips or servers and carries it away to heat the, ex the, heat, to the heat exchanger where is it cooled and recirculated. The liquid cooling can provide more precise temperature control and better heat dissipation than chilled water loop cooling, but it's also more expensive and complex to implement and maintain. The chilled water cooling is less efficient, but it's less expensive to install and maintain. So again, the best cooling method for you as a data center operator will depend on your specific ITE needs and also your overall CAPEX and OPEX studies. So Evangeline, maybe you can explain more regarding the immersion cooling and what are the difference, differences between the one phase and two phases and how are they typically used? Um, I'd love to. Uh, so first, let's talk about immersion cooling. So as a method, immersion cooling requires two different ways to cool computers and electronics. Um, and the difference really starts around the dielectric liquid that we decide to use in that immersion. So that's why we need to talk about what would be called the single phase immersion cooling first, and also what was called two phase immersion cooling. And lastly, we'll talk about direct to chip. Um, so let's, we need to understand the differences between each immersion cooling technique to recognize which would be d better depending on the application and the needs of the data center. Um, the two types of immersion cooling work by submerging the entire servers into a liquid coolant. In single phase, the coolant remains liquid the entire time. And while in two phase, the coolant also transitions to gas. Um, and then lastly, direct to chip cooling works by pumping liquid coolant through a metal plate that connects to a processor. Um, and with direct to chip, it can be one phase, it could have glycol, or in the case of two phase waterless cooling, flexible tubes um, bring a safe, non flammable dielectric fluid directly to the processing chip. So the fluid then absorbs the heat by turning into vapor, which then carries the heat out of the IT equipment. No water is used in the system. So the equipment is protected, therefore, by from any corrosion and other water related threats that there could be. Um, and there's really no more direct method for dissipating and removing heat than that. Um, so immersion cooling or direct to chip, their main goal is just to reject the heat from the processors and chips. So you need to transfer the heat out of the system with a heat exchanger like Dan Foss's microplate and microchannel heat exchangers, plus complementary valves, sensors, VFDs, and pumps. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about what high performance computing is and how it's affecting how people think about cooling. Ken, I'm gonna give this question to you. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, thanks. So high performance computing is the ability to process data and perform complex calculations at high speeds. Faster CPUs and GPUs are being developed to meet these demands, such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, Internet of Things, and other evolving computing technologies. These microchips have an increasing power density, which means they generate more heat than it can be, that needs to be removed. Liquid cooling becomes essential to ensuring reliability and performance. Both types of liquid cooling, direct-to-chip, and immersion cooling are required to remove the heat from the source level, the chips themselves. So there's a shift away from direct expansion cooling to liquid cooling using dry coolers, mini pumps, 
heat exchangers such as the Danfoss microplate raised plate heat exchanger. So let's talk about the demand for speed to market causing the rise of modular data centers and uh, edge computing. Um, and Michael, I'm going to have you, I'm going to direct this question to you. With compounded annual growth rates up to 15%, the data center industry cannot build data centers fast enough to meet demands. Um, this is going to include new buildings and retrofits too. Michael, can you explain a little bit about what that means and why we're seeing a rise in the modular data centers and edge computing? Yes, Evangeline, edge data centers are located closer to the users and their devices that collect and transmit the data. So whatever the data is generated, there's where you need uh, an edge data center. Typically, they are powered by edge caching, and uh, that is hardware or software-based componentry that temporarily store data in order to decrease the computing response time, otherwise known as latency. So the speed of transferring data, processing it, and then taking action is essential. And that's why you have edge uh, data centers. There's a statistic that says that 58% of companies are expected to increase their spend on edge computing. So you can imagine edge computing is, is extremely important and growing rapidly. And Therefore, we are noticing a shift that is leading to more modular systems, including the HVAC equipment, and we are seeing the rise in data centers and, mod and edge data centers and modularization because they scale up and deploy very quickly in response to the increasing market demand. So Evangeline, I think we need to pivot a little bit and talk about decarbonization because in a new Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change report, scientists are stating that the world is likely to pass a dangerous temperature threshold within the next 10 years. So decarbonization is essential and it's urgent. How can data centers, Evangeline, contribute to emissions reductions and sustainability? Any thoughts on this? Um, great question, Michael. So as we mentioned earlier, um, it's estimated that data centers use as much as 2% of the worldwide electricity demand, which just to give you um, some frame of reference is about 400 terawatts, um, terawatt hours globally. And this generates a substantial amount of greenhouse gases. Um, some estimates say that data centers account for as much as 3% of the global carbon emissions, which is roughly equal to the output of, of a global airline industry, which is mind boggling. Um, and the news, the good news is that there are several ways to make data centers more environmentally friendly, and it goes well beyond uh, looking for alternative sources of energy. So are there important KPIs related to decarbonization? Yeah, let me take that question, Rami. So, yes, uh, a sustainable data center is one that actively works to reduce power usage, energy, water, and carbon emissions, lowering the power usage effectiveness, PUE, which measures the ratio of the total power coming from the data center to the power consumed by information technology equipment. Plus, water usage effectiveness is also important, WE, carbon use effectiveness, and these are key measurements using for the to sustainability and net zero carbon targets. PUE, WE, ERE, C are key performance indicators and are carbon inventory metrics that are used by data centers. These are accurate and consistent carbon inventories to essentially for identifying the main sources of emissions and global comparison to carbon reduction progress. So I think it's important that we define what a sustainable data center is. Rami, how would you define a, a sustainable data center? And let's talk about the features, what features it, it generally includes in the terms of the HVAC system. Well, Ken mentioned the great four key performance indicators that data centers um, can use to measure their sustainability. These KPIs are power usage effectiveness, carbon usage effectiveness, water usage effectiveness, and also energy reuse factor. Um, measuring these KPIs requires looking at the entire data center infrastructure, including the mechanical systems that support data center cooling and IT equipment thermal management. These mechanical systems account for as much as 30 to 40% of the power used by a data center. Adopting high efficient and latest cooling technologies can reduce data center cooling systems energy consumption. 
This can lead to significant re reductions in the PUE, CUE, and WEE for a data center. By adopting these technologies and measuring their KPIs, data centers can become more sustainable and reduce their environmental impact. So the adoption of highly efficient and latest cooling technologies of chillers, fans, pumps, HVAC equipment, cooling distribution unit, you name it. These type of cooling uh, components and aspects are key in reducing electrical energy consumption and thereby defi defining them and measuring a sustainable data center. I completely agree. So, uh, Ken, can you talk and expand a little bit upon some of the HVC equipment solutions that you mentioned earlier that can help increase data center sustainability and reduce energy consumption? Sure. Since data centers run processes 24-7, which means they run every day, every week, much of the cooling in data centers is achieved by using rotating equipment and machinery such as refrigerant compressors, fans, and pumps. These devices must be driven by the most efficient motors and connected to variable speed drives that matches the output of the computing demand while at the same time saving energy and providing exact power needed by the motor at any one moment. The effect of VSDs, variable speed drives, have on energy consumption is huge. Chillers with oil-free magnetic bearing VSD compressors are some of the most efficient pieces of equipment used in data centers because they offer efficient heat transfer and reliable cooling throughout their life. It's like without the maintenance requirements and performance degradation experienced by other types of compressors. Improving sustainability requires recovering and reusing the heat from the data center. This heat can be recovered by using energy station and depending on the heat host application can be used raw or boosted heat through a heat pump to meet the temperature required. So, Michael, what role do you see for renewable energy sources? Let's talk a little bit about solar, wind, geothermal, and data center cooling. Yeah, initially, Evangeline, renewable energy sources were part of a program designed to offset carbon emissions. So solar, wind, and geothermal in data centers have been around for some time, and data center operators have been harnessing renewable energy for carbon offsets for more than 10 years. Um, but as data center operators adopted science-based targets for emissions reductions, specifically scope two emissions, adopting green energy sources solidifies their commitment to achieving carbon neutrality across their operations as part of their environmental, social, and governance goals. So we are seeing basically two trends when it comes to renewable energy. The first one being PPAs power purchase agreements. More and more data center operators, as well as other industries, are securing power purchase agreements for renewable energy. There's a lot of renewable energy that is available and uh, coming online in the immediate future. So these agreements to secure green power for cooling systems, as well as the ITE, make total sense. By the way, Danfoss North America is also doing the same we will purchase about 75 megawatts of solar power from a solar farm in Texas starting in 2025 for 12 years initially, allowing Danfoss to fully replace its annual electricity usage in North America with green energy through at least 2037. So I mentioned that there are two um, trends going on. The first one is power purchase agreement, PPAs. The second one is that power in data centers is used more efficiently. There are less watts consumed per click, if you will. So with a rapid rise in the number of clicks and power demand, if this green power from renewable sources is also used more efficiently to cool new or renovated data centers, there's an accelerated effect in decarbonization and a shorter time to meet net zero. Thanks, Michael. Evangeline, how do you see the future of data center sustainability evolving over the next five to 10 years? So because of the concerns over cybersecurity and privacy, data centers, especially the hyperscalers, have developed real-time AI-assisted monitoring and tracking systems for optimizing operations, predictive and service maintenance, energy consumption, optimization, capacity management, and planning. 
Um, there's also third party SAAS or solutions um, as a service packages that offer additional insights, um, such as predictive analysis, uh, predictive analytics to service enterprise and data centers. Um, and then energy audits and installing smart devices, such as energy metering, can help identify areas of improvement. Um, and contractors can install sensors that feed information to cloud-based monitoring of essential components of the cooling system, such as TurboCore cloud services. And this will keep systems running at peak performance and thereby reduce carbon emissions. Um, and lastly, Rami, can you share with us Dan Foss's approach to sustainability? Yeah, sure. Um, we have a main goal in Danfoss, and our main goal is to reach CO2 neutrality for all of our global operations by 2030. We are leading the green transition by working with our customers to create engineering solutions that help the world use energy in a smarter and more efficient ways. Uh, Danfoss have set and executed ambitious standards and stretched targets across climate, people, environmental agenda. Our new 2030 ESG ambition shapes a bold direction for Danfoss toward our goal of becoming our customer's preferred decarbonization partner. And we have built a solid foundation for achieving this through our own science-based targets. And Michael, maybe you can tell them more in regards to our uh, commitment here in Danfoss in regards to sustainability. Yeah, yes, Rami. Yes, I can add that Danfoss commits to reduce 46.2% of absolute scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 from a 2019 uh, base year. Danfoss also commits to reduce absolute scope three greenhouse gas emissions by 15% within the same time frame. We furthermore commit to reduce our scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2030 through energy efficiency measures, reuse of heat uh, from our processes and buildings, and sourcing of renewable energy, and only use offsetting as a last resort. And also, we commit to reduce scope three greenhouse gas emissions from purchased goods and services by 25% by 2030 from a 2019 base year. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our CO Neutral headquarters. So in addition to what Rami and Michael have discussed, um, Danfoss headquarters, which is in Norberg, Denmark, became CO2 neutral, CO2 neutral in 2022. But the, the journey is really remarkable, and it starts a few years back in 2015. Um, the headquarter campus was 100% heated by fossil fuels. And in 2024, the excess heat from Danfoss newly built data centers will contribute with 25% of the overall heat supply for the approximately 3 million square feet of factories and offices that we have. Yeah, Danfoss has decided to do green data centers. In response to the exponential growth of data centers consumption, Danfoss has decided to build a data center that will be an example for future climate-friendly designs. Danfoss has the technologies to cool data centers in a much greener way, reduce energy consumption, and to reuse the heat from other applications. We cool our data centers in a very efficient way, and we recover and reuse the heat produced within the data center. This is what we consider a green digitalization. The technology is good chillers and heat pumps featuring Danfoss turbo core compressors that allow data centers to be cooled up to 30% more efficiently. Danfoss also has an innovative solution for heat recovery. Excess heat is generated by the server equipment as part of the data center operation and is discharged into the atmosphere. Using this excess heat and heating applications instead of allowing to escape represents a massive opportunity for Danfoss to provide an environmentally friendly solution that will help customers who reuse this heat for their processes to meet their net zero targets. Wow, so it really sounds like Danfoss solutions can really help you do more with less when it comes to achieving sustainability. So we'd like to thank you all for joining us. This is all the time we have for today. Make it a great day.